CJ joins us again, the Times, the Times Online and Rugby Pass. Chris, morning again. Welcome. Yes, morning to uh, the end of rugby as we know it here in uh, in England. It's uh, it's one of those days you never thought would come along, but the two-time European champions and uh, numerous premiership titles, Wasps, are no more. They have gone, they're in administration, and they will be relegated. It's, uh, they join Worcester, so there's two down. That leaves 11 more clubs. We'll see how many more go before the end of the year. Look, I want to I want to get into this. I want to tap into what on earth has caused this financial calamity, this meltdown, and, 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 and what it means actually for club rugby, what it means for the sport there in England. Let's come back to that. First and foremost, on the weekend, England-France, 13-7. As I've dropped the line in a couple of times, I'll butter boom it with you. Good to see that the England woman can play 10-man rugby like the, blo- like the blokes, eh? And they better against you lot because as Wales exposed your inability to stop the driving more, England now, when they come up against you guys, as they inevitably will, will spend the entire 80 minutes mauling you to death because they cannot afford to give your backs the ball because they will be run out of the competition. Now, it was fantastic to see, wasn't it? A really close match, two really good teams. These teams will be going hammer and tongs each other now for the last couple of seasons. And as typical of of French versus England, it's the massive bludgeon of England against the rapier of France. And it was just a great contrast, wasn't it? But uh, England found a way of winning and uh, it will do them a power of good because they've got to come up with something different other than just trying to arm wrestle teams. Yeah, Whitney Hanson said afterwards, now it's been reported and quoted all over the press here as say, her saying that England are beatable. Now, when you actually look at the quote that she made, she didn't actually come out and say that. That's kind of been, been a bit twisted around. <laughs> and that, you know, So, I mean, her saying, hey, England are beatable is a heck of a news story, but she didn't. She said there are vulnerab- vulnerabilities there and, and, and perhaps they showed a way that they could be beaten. And look, you can say that about any team, can't you? But a lot of kicking, a lot of set piece, a lot of ball retention. That the way that we thought they would play. Yeah, it's not going to be a shock to anybody, is it? I mean, Simon Middleton, the coach, has tried to expand their game plan, but but look, why would you go away? And this has been a Eddie Jones's uh, monotonous uh, quote, isn't it? That you know, he wants an England team playing the England way, and that's 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 no, there's nothing wrong with that, Marty. Isn't the England way winning though? Isn't that what Test rugby is? You get more points than the opposition. I mean, we kind of forget that here in New Zealand sometimes, Chris. We think that we've got this you know, uh, obligation to attack and play all kinds of sort of, you know, fast-paced, pin-your-ears-back kind of rugby. But Test Rugby and World Cups are about winning the trophy. Absolutely. If you look at England back in 2003 when they won, their best performances were against you lot in Wellington and Australia in, in, uh, in Melbourne. Long before the tournament took place, they had climbed the hill. They were on the way down. But what they had was a self-belief and a winning habit. And that's exactly what this England women's team has got so when they have those situations where they're not playing as well as they could, yeah, and, and that's a lot down to the way that the French defence just closed them down in the backs. They they looked they looked short of ideas, and 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 that was great to see. But you know, pragmatism is in the is in the English DNA, and there's nothing wrong with it. And at times, I'm sure uh, in the last couple of seasons, you would have liked the All Blacks to be a bit more pragmatic because you know it's great to win 42-41. Oh boy, it doesn't do much for your heart. But it has us. It, it, it leaves you panting and wanting, you know, some certainty in life. And if the All Blacks aren't winning in the sort of distance that the English women are doing now, we're heading towards what, what 30 matches unbeaten by the end of this tournament. I mean, that is a hell of a record in any international sport. And if they have to do it by arm wrestling and driving malls and kicking for the corners, then why not? Chris Jones, Times, Times Online and Rugby Pass with us. It was an 8 o'clock start here, so it was was a later kickoff, and we did this, of course, uh, we noted that this this happened during the 2011 Men's Rugby World Cup as well. So so the time was more conducive to you watching it up there. What kind of audience do you think it got? Uh, It's been reported around a million people got up early in the morning to watch this, and that's for a women's rugby match international yes it was an international but it's still a lot of people getting up to watch a sport they probably haven't watched before and those figures are just going to build and and the fact it was a real contest helped the spectacle enormously i mean quite honestly if you were a scots uh, fan you wouldn't be getting up at all would you how many more of those narrow defeats can you take it's just like oh please go back to bed but for english fans they are watching a winning team and yeah, you know, that that is what you need to get that 
that real generation of momentum, both in New Zealand and back here in terms of this getting lots of space in the papers. And it's being shown on ITV, one of the main stations. And that's that, that's that's a big step for this sport. OK, let's go to the other question, which is always coming up, Chris, is is women's rugby financially viable? Can it be commercially? Can it can it be commercially exploited? Um, can it stand on its own economic two feet? I think that question now has got to be brought into the whole goddamn sport. I mean, when you're seeing clubs in England, historical clubs, you know, legend clubs, you know, um, what what are these um, original clubs? being bankrupted like wasps and then you look down the list of all the clubs that are in financial trouble and stress at the moment how did it get to this stage and also so what now happens to wasps who pays that bill well i don't think that the, the one thing you can definitely say is that women's rugby hasn't been responsible for any of the massive debts that the men have managed to run up yeah you know, wasps are 155 years old even older than that it's just amazing but their debts are probably heading towards 100 million they made the big mistake of going to the mini bond market and selling thirty five million pounds worth of bonds to fans and promised to pay them back. And you know what? They haven't got thirty five million. They also don't have enough money to pay the tax man, uh, the electricity bill or even their staff. So one hundred and sixty seven employees that uh, that's from the rugby side, uh, from the netball team, because they have a professional netball team. And the backroom staff are all redundant, wow. including John Mitchell, your old All Black coach. He's yep. currently helping uh, Japan. He learned t- today uh, that he was redundant. Uh, also, uh, Brad Shields is redundant, and Vincent Cock, the uh, the Springbok World Cup winning tight end who only joined uh, Wasps this season, has hardly played for them. He's also redundant, and so you, we fully expect the team, just like Worcester to start being uh, cherry-picked. Vincent will probably head off to France. Jack Willis and Joe Launchbury will probably go to London Irish and Harlequins. Uh, It's just a shambles. And that all comes down to the fact that the fit and proper ownership rules have not been applied to rugby as they have been in football. And, okay, they're bad enough in football when when you allow the Saudis to come in and buy your teams. But... People have been taking charge of clubs without the ability or the financial clout to keep these clubs going. They've relied on things like CVC coming in, giving £200 million for 27% of Premiership Rugby. And then what do they do with that money? Some of the owners just squirreled it away. Others used it to build new stadium and others just paid for more players. And wages now cannot be paid for by the gates. They cannot be paid for by the TV sponsorship. And so England are in a situation now where they can't rely on the RFU because you know they they don't have the money because of all the losses they've made, and so they're gonna they're gonna talk about central contracts. Central contracts should have been done in 1996, but you know what the RFU did then? They had a moratorium. The rest of the world said it's professional rugby, not England. They had a one-year moratorium in the hope that it would go away, and in that one year. All the players are signed up by the clubs. So when the RFU said, well, this stuff, the, you know, this professional thing, might, might, that might be something in it. Uh, oh, where are the players gone? And since that date, it's been a shambles in terms of control, as other unions have over this, their top players. And now they're going to try and reverse the car back into central contracts. It's going to be a hell of a mess. Chris Jones with us. So, okay, let's talk about this then. We have central contracts. The Politburo can control absolutely everything. They also, you know, sell off private ownership. Supposedly the Super Rugby franchise has retained 51%. I mean, it is the Kremlin. They do have their finger in absolutely every bit of your pastry before it touches your plate. But what it means is that we can keep our All Blacks. Without that, if the clubs own them, well, it would just be a full-on transfer market like English Premier League uh, football is. So how on how on earth can this possibly be reversed? I, I, I just don't even understand the logistics of where you would start with it. It would just be lawyers upon lawyers and layers and layers, wouldn't it? Well, of course, it, they tried this in uh, English cricket, and what a shambles that's been, because they essentially contract a certain number of players, and then they decide whether those players can play for the counties. And, of course... The county supporters never see, you know, Sid and Doris sitting in the, in the stand at Trenbridge never see their England players playing for, for Nottinghamshire because England want to keep them for international. So that's the great worry about nominating 30 players who will be centrally contracted and their wages will be paid for by the RFU if they can find enough money to do that. 
then they will be, if you like, loaned back to their clubs to play in matches when the RFU agree. Well, there's no guarantee that that will be for 18, 20 matches that would be needed during a season. Uh, and so they have the same situation and same arguments that you've got in cricket now. We don't see our top players, which is funny enough, the arguments on at the moment because they still don't see their players even when the clubs own them. Because, yeah, there's a, there's a finite number of matches these players can play because, you know, we're talking about player welfare all, all the time. Well, the latest idea is that you decide to have two tiers of English rugby where there's 10 teams in the top and then there's probably 12 teams in the second division. You saw, somehow find enough money to pay for those two divisions and therefore you have fewer matches in the 10 team league than you're having at the moment because we started this season with 13 and we're now down to 11 you know if it goes on any further they will get 10 teams it's purely by the fact that three teams would have gone under so yeah there's so many things that english rugby has to sort out and they're also trying to win the world cup next year and don't worry eddie's in charge so i'm sure it'll be fine Chris, so just quickly back to that. So with Wasps, they go into, what is it, receivership or they go into liquidation? Can the doors actually be administration. shut? Administration. Yeah. Oh, administration. Ah, administration. OK, so somebody comes in and takes over the financial side. They don't just, but they've, they've, they've made all these people redundant. How do they get them back then to play second division rugby? Do they actually have to rewrite new contracts? How does that work? And, and, and is there any recourse for any of these players? I mean, can they actually get compensation on the, on the deals and the contracts that they've signed? No, because they become creditors, don't they? Because their salaries are part of the money's owed. When you go into administration, if you come out of administration, then yeah, the, the people who are owed money may get yeah, 10p in the pound. You know, they, people are just not going to get the money they're owed. So you know, that is the big problem. And you, the only way they're going to get a new owner, and same with Worcester as well, is you go into administration, you create a new company, you leave the debt behind. And this is the sort of thing the shoddy builders do. You know, they set up a building company, run up massive debts, don't pay all the suppliers and just change the name and set up a new company. again. Yeah, we get a lot this of that. is happening in rugby yeah. now. This is this is happening in rugby, which is which is awful because there's been an awful lot of people who who gave their money and time to these clubs in good faith who are going to be left out of pocket, massively out of pocket. But the clubs will still survive in the championship, but be run by new owners who say they will have no responsibility for the previous debts. And that's how these two teams are going to live again, but with much smaller squads, because they won't be able to play, pay the sort of salaries they have been paying, and they will try and get out of the second division into the premiership. And that it, it leaves a really horrible taste in the mouth for all those people who supported those clubs with their own money, with their own services, and they're basically being, you know, being, being sent away and being told, well, hard luck. Thanks for your support, but it counted for nothing in the end. Finally then, sabbaticals. Adi Savir has announced overnight has got a sabbatical after next year's Rugby World Cup. He's going to Japan. Now, I know that you know we a lot of us here in New Zealand, we squeal about this and we go, I mean, this is ridiculous. This is, I mean, we never get to see our best players. They're not playing super rugby there. That's why the NPC is stuffed and no one goes along to it and everything. All of us in any employee, if we were offered that opportunity, hey, you can leave where you're working at the moment. You can go for four months in Japan, earn 20 times the money, come back and have your job and it's just sitting there waiting for you. Of course we'd take it. So I don't begrudge him at all. But the question is, can your players do this? Are the clubs allowed to let them go for sabbaticals? Do they let them go for sabbaticals? Do you even have a concept called sabbaticals? Uh, no, we have a thing called a, a, a hamster wheel where they put the players on and they just keep running and running and running until they fall off. And then they have a sabbatical. That's what's known as retirement. Right. No, we don't have this. But it's funny, that, you know, this situation where the players in the England squad, Jack Willis, for example, has been called up by England today yeah, he's be, just been made redundant on the same day. Now, if he wants to play, if he can find a club in England, great. If he can't, they've now said that they will have a change to the rule, which usually said that you, know, you have to be a special exception to be picked by England if you're not playing in England. Well, there's going to be so many players who are going to have to go to France to play that they will be then uh, allowed to play for England while playing in France. But you know what? They'll play more matches in France than they would have done playing in England. So it's, it's even worse as a sabbatical. That that wheel has just started going, turning faster and faster, and the players will be even more knackered. So no, there are no chances of sabbaticals. There's just endless, endless work. It's like we used to send. We're back to the days when you send small children up the chimneys to clean them. It's that it's that bad over here now at the moment, Marty.